your time to come here today. I know there's a very competitive program on, but um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the only event being held at either major party conference on AUKUS, which is pretty shocking to me. Um, and I think, you know, something that we will be discussing today is how we sort of push the UK to be a much more ambitious partner in this project, because the prize there and what we're trying to do with AUKUS is, is pretty extraordinary. We have identified that technology uh, will be the absolute epicenter, the most vital foundation of our future prosperity, economic growth, but it's also at the absolute heart of the geostrategic competition that we're engaged in at the moment in a deteriorating global environment. So uh, a, a lot of people are probably aware of pillar one of AUKUS, which is about the submarines. Uh, there's a lot to be excited about in there. Um, this is not just about uh, building the submarines themselves, but the enormous infrastructure and skills project that there's going to have to be around uh, building up our work workforce capabilities. And what that project is trying to do is, is deliver a mutual uplift across the three partners. So it's a win-win-win project. But there's also a second pillar to AUKUS, which is about advanced uh, technological capabilities. And these are the capabilities that we've identified to be the most vital to our future security and prosperity. And this project should, if we can pull it off, help us to get those to market much more, quick, much more quickly than otherwise. And that is an enormous, an enormous win, um, not just for us here in the UK, but for our partners as well. So I'm delighted that we're having the opportunity to talk about this, and um, I'm hoping that at future party conferences it will be um, a much more prominent theme because um, it is something that deserves all of our attention. We have a wonderful panel here to discuss this today. Uh, I'll start with His Excellency Stephen Smith, the Australian High Commissioner to the UK, uh, formerly a long-serving member of Parliament in Australia, holding the positions of Minister for Defence, Foreign Affairs and for Trade. Um, and he was also the co-author of the Defence Strategic Review published earlier this year, which was received very well here in the UK as well. We have Alicia Kearns, the MP for Rutland and Welton, and also the chair of the Common Foreign Affairs Select Committee. Uh, she's been a hugely active campaigner in upskilling the UK's uh, capabilities towards China um, and has overseen several major committee publications uh, dealing with this and other associated issues, including the recent inquiry into the Indo-Pacific tilt. Uh, Nick Chafee is the CEO um, of the UK uh, division at Northrop Grumman, um, previously at PA Consulting, where he was the founder and lead for its global defence and security business, previously in the Royal Corps of Naval Constructors at the Ministry of Defence. Uh, Ted Bromond here is a senior research fellow in Anglo-American relations at the Heritage Foundation, uh, previously uh, the associate director of international security studies at Yale University. And uh, last but not least, Alexander Downer, the former Australian High Commissioner, so you've got two <laughs> High Commissioners, um, but also former Australian Minister for Foreign Affairs between 96 and 2007, the longest serving ever Australian Foreign Minister. Um, he's currently the chairman here at Policy Exchange um, and also the chairman of the Royal Overseas League. So. Um, Thank you to all of our wonderful panelists and really looking forward to the conversation here. We're going to start with some opening remarks from um, the panelists, some thoughts um, on this uh, really vital project and how we should take it forward. And then we'll go into a bit of a discussion and um, please get your questions ready because we will be having time for Q&A later in the session. So without further ado, I will um, call on Stephen to kick us off. Well, thanks very much, Sophia. I'm very pleased to share the panel with uh, one of my predecessors, Alexander Downer, so it's great to see Alexander here. But that compels me to also acknowledge voluntarily and enthusiastically uh, George Brandis, who's my immediate predecessor, uh, and as well uh, Phil Goff, who is the current serving New Zealand High Commissioner of the United Kingdom. I'm not sure what the collective noun is for High Commissioners. It could be a catastrophe of High Commissioners, but we'll, <laughs> we'll have to wait and see how well or badly Alexander and I go on the panel. Um, but the, the topic or the, the, the title is um, AUKUS, a vital project for a, sh a sharpening geopolitical landscape. Well, first point, there is no doubt that 
the reason that AUKUS, a trilateral technology partnership between the United States, the United Kingdom and Australia, is caused by changed strategic circumstances. So that's the first point. And that changed strategic circumstances, of course, a changed and much more assertive uh, China. So uh, what does AUKUS do? Uh, Sophia outlined some of the aspects of it, but I think it's very important to focus on both pillars of AUKUS. Of course, we have firstly the submarine project, which is an enormous security endeavour to grow the, the, uh, the capability of uh, those three nations, uh, all of our capabilities, so that the sum is greater than, uh, the sum of the whole is greater than the parts, increased capability, US, UK and Australia, so we have more additional lines producing nuclear powered, conventionally armed submarines in Australia's case. That's a huge security endeavour, but it's a, it's a huge uh, employment, manufacturing, uh, investment, skills and training, people endeavour. Uh, that, that will transform, for example, the economy of, of uh, Port Adelaide and Adelaide, uh, where Alexander comes from. It will also transform the economy of south of Perth in Western Australia, where the maintenance of the nuclear-powered submarines will eventually be affected. So these are huge jobs, employment, skills, training, joint endeavours. On AUKUS Pillar 2, uh, and Sophia said we haven't heard as much about that uh, if you're on the outside, uh, I think AUKUS Pillar 2 has enormous potential for both our countries, both in terms of, both in terms of uh, research and development and military capability, but also, again, research and development skills, training and jobs. Uh, and there we're looking at well, what future technology can be of advantage to our three nations, whether it's hypersonics, whether it's underwater submersibles, artificial intelligence and the like. Uh, my own view, and I've articulated this on a number of occasions, is that AUKUS Pillar 2 in some respects is harder to grip up than Pillar 1. In the end, Pillar 1 is one subject matter, one content. It's a huge endeavour, but nonetheless it's a submarine project. Whereas how do we grip up strategically different areas of, of IP, three different jurisdictions or countries at different stages of development? where the IP may be owned in public hands, for example, a defence and science technology group, or in private hands, which could be private hands as large as Lockheed Martin or BAE, or two people working out of a garage in Port Melbourne. So gripping that up uh, is, is proving to be more difficult than Pillar 1. But also, now that we've got implementation of Pillar 1 well underway, and you've seen the uh, news this morning in the Financial Times about uh, the BAE decision, the Australian Government will make its decision on the AUKUS SSN build before the end of the first quarter of next year. But now that we've got implementation well underway for Pillar 1, it is time to focus now on Pillar 2. Uh, and uh, that's a, a body of work ahead of us. As a general proposition, and, and I'll finish on this point because Sophia doesn't want us to do uh, lengthy uh, intros, I think the, the real uh, uh, lesson for AUKUS, for the UK-Australia bilateral relationship, I think is that there's never been a better time to be High Commissioner uh, in London, but there's also never been a better time to grip up the nature of the relationship. Uh, we talk about the transformation and the modernisation of the Australia-UK relationship, and that's primarily driven by uh, AUKUS, Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, also driven by our new free trade agreement, which gives enormous opportunities both on goods, services, investment, innovation, government procurement but also by things which we haven't put under a piece of architecture. Uh, for example, the energy transition, the financing of the energy transition, uh, supply chain, critical mineral diversity and the like. These are huge bodies of work which are an overlapping layer of, of concentric circles of, of security and economic activity. Uh, and it's reawakened, in my view, just how like-minded we are and just how well and easily we work together. It's also, I think, reflected the UK's deep desire to make the point, as is, as is made in the refresh, that what's occurring in the Indo-Pacific is an epoch-changing strategic circumstance change. In Australian, that would be uh, what's occurring in, uh, in the NATO Atlantic theatre is obviously relevant, highly important, and we need to send a signal about pushing back on illegal invasions. But the main strategic circumstance change is in the Indo-Pacific, namely a changed China. And as a consequence for that, we need to engage in integrated defence and deterrence. We need to bring all aspects of like-minded multi-power, uh, multipolar reflection of power uh, to, uh, to, to bear. And that's why, from Australia's perspective, it's really important to acknowledge that the UK is now the second biggest economy in the P TPP after Japan. So Japan, UK and Australia now form an essential ballast in the TPP. 
With the TPP's largest economy, you're doing a jet fighter program. Uh, in my view, you will land a free trade agreement with the Indians and a strategic partnership with the Indians before the, the, the uh, World Cup is over. Uh, you, 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 in addition to the jet fighter program with Japan, you've got the uh, Hiroshima Accord. Uh, yeah. The Korean president will be here by the end of the year uh, with ambition to land precisely the same uh, type of arrangement. Uh, and we've seen the strategic partnership with Singapore. That really shows that the United Kingdom is deeply invested into the Indo-Pacific, just as Australia understands that what occurs in the NATO Atlantic theatre is also relevant for the Indo-Pacific. So we shouldn't look uh, at the UK involvement in the Indo-Pacific just in terms of AUKUS. There are a whole range of measures which the UK uh, has been effecting over the last two or three years, all of which have deep strategic significance for the Indo-Pacific. So AUKUS is one of those concentric circles, but there are a range of others. Thanks. Thank you so much, Stephen, and uh, thank you also for making the point about the Indo-Pacific tilt being so much sort of conceptualised as in terms of our partnerships rather than this narrative that the UK sort of was out there on its own, uh, you know, with a kind of boosterish uh, motivation there. This is deeply about our partnerships. Alicia. Uh, well, I think essentially you, you set out exactly the parameters and how important this is for the UK and why it matters. But this is a revolutionary alliance, and we shouldn't forget about that. And the reason it's revolutionary is that it is essentially one of the sorts of alliances. The UK needs a constellation of alliances around the world on which we will build our security. And AUKUS is going to be one of the absolute core ones. And yes, what we recognise to be one of the most likely to be one of the hottest theatres, whether it be in terms of not outright warfare, but in terms of prevent, preventing conflict, making sure that we are able to continue to have the mobility we need to be able to operate where we are. Um, this is a wider, a sign of the wider shift within geopolitics, a recognition that national security has to come before economic security. Now, many people think that isn't a big difference. It is a fundamental difference. You could have the best possible economics, but when national security emergencies come, your economics go out the window. And AUKUS should really play a part in helping us recognize that. But it's also key in terms of that assertiveness of hostile states. And what AUKUS is proving and the arguments that it's forcing people to have around the world is that one, we have to stop talking about industrial strategies as if it is somehow a dirty word. This is a form of industrial strategy, AUKUS. And it is absolutely right that we recognize that in an era of hostilities, we need to have one. It is, as I say, a constellation of alliances. This will be a core backbone for us. It is about securing technological advantage, and this is the big problem over the last 10 years, potentially 20 years, when the UK should have been focused on those, essentially securing that technological advancement. Instead, we've been getting into bed with a partner who has been f purposely focused on trying to make us dependent on them. And when you are dependent on someone, you are castrated on the world stage. You are unable to have the movement you need, the maneuver, the ability, the flex, and essentially the hardcore power that you need to stand up against them. So rather than focusing on technological advancement over the last 20 years, we've been becoming more vulnerable. We now need to do a dual path over the next 20 years, between now and 2050, which is the target the Chinese are working to, where we have to do two things at once. That's going to be an incredibly big challenge. But AUKUS plays a big role in recognizing that we can share that weight and we can work together to do it. And the final recognition that AUKUS brings to us is that of deterrence. And the reality is we are in the era of deterrence diplomacy. And the last 10 years, we have seen a failure of that around the world. We saw that in Ukraine. That is our shared failure. We are seeing that in Kosovo and in the Balkans at the moment, despite so many of us having raised our voices. And there is a risk with Taiwan that unless we recognize now the need to deter, and deterrence means meaningfully having positions, supporting them, protecting them, lining up in advance and making clear that you will stand by them, we will be in real trouble. But all is also the realization of essentially hard power in the Indo-Pacific by the UK, which is something many people said was not going to happen and has. Um, the reality for me, really, the priority is how we move from concept to reality. That's what we should be investing every single moment in, making sure that we don't waste the opportunities of caucus. Um, as you know, you touched on, Stephen, we've had really good news yesterday about the sub program and in terms of BAE systems. We're in a good place, but we can't waste our chances when it comes to pillar two. So in terms of that overall vision, for me, AUKUS cannot be seen as something that is in the preserve of the MOD. This is a whole of government response. This is a whole of government focus because it's not just subs. It is the technologies, technologies of the 21st century that are going to determine whether the rules-based system wins out. We are in a race and technologies will help us protect that. It is the cyber, the long range, the AI, you name it. But that national project requires us to make sure we have the skills, 
that we are focusing on the systems, the supply chains, the investment and minimising bureaucracy, which is something in the UK we are just not good at. The MOD loves to tell other people to get the tanks off their lawns and other government departments hear the word defence or national security and put their fingers in their ears and pretend that it's got nothing to do with their remit. In terms of practicalities, <clears throat> those bureaucratic barriers do worry me, and I know Steve and I have had conversations about this. There is work to be done within government to overcome the bureaucratic uh, barriers that are preventing us moving forward as quickly as we can with AUKUS. Interoperability is another one where you just come up against systemic friction, and we need to make sure we push past that. There is also an urgency. There was a recent report by an Australian think tank which showed that the Chinese are ahead of us on 19 of the 23 technologies that we are looking to develop in Strand B. So they are far ahead of us, so we have a lot of catching up to do. From my own perspective, in the Indo-Pacific report that we released a few weeks ago, we have called for Japan and South Korea to be introduced not into the whole of AUKUS in its entirety, but into that strand B piece of work. Because as Stephen said out, the UK has already got many technological agreements with them. We think they'd be a natural partner. But also we'd like to see AUKUS expanded to look more at supply chain resilience. And yes, we now have a critical minerals agreement, which is very good. But actually between Australia, the UK and the US, supply chain resilience is something that absolutely should be key. Um, I just finish up by saying that AUKUS does need the wider geopolitical dipl diplomatic work done to support it. So yes, CPTPP is good news, ASEAN Dialogue Partner is good news, the trade deal with India which will likely come is good news. But I think we should be joining the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which Australia is already in. I think we should be joining the Quad, and if not the Quad Plus, alongside New Zealand, Vietnam and South Korea. And we should be making sure that we show that in the Indo-Pacific, AUKUS may be our hard power realisation, but we are here for the long term and we are going to make a meaningful commitment. So ultimately, I'm optimistic, but we can't be complacent. And we have to recognise that this is not just an alliance. It goes so far beyond that. But if we aren't willing to recognise it as a proper project that needs full-time management and pushing through the entirety of the UK system, we will not realise its full potential. Thank you, Alicia, and I could not agree with you more. I find it absolutely astonishing that the SRO for this project has been put in the Ministry of Defence. And, you know, when we're talking about technologies here that are so vital, not just for our defensive capabilities, but with civilian uses, totally vital to our economic prosperity, it, it seems mad to just run this as a defence delivery kind of project. So we've got a great record of delivering defence projects on time to <laughs> schedule <laughs> exceptional standards. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And I'd, I will definitely be coming back to your point about an industrial strategy because I think that's going to be key. Uh, Nick. Thank you. Well, my esteemed colleagues have already highlighted the kind of geopolitics and strategic priority of AUKUS, which I entirely recognise. And I think um, if we look at what it means in the Pacific, I think it's a fundamental shift in the politics and a fundamental shift in the deterrence, particularly to China which we see as an increasingly rising threat. Um, and from an industrial point of view, I guess I look at it from two perspectives. Um, one is time, which may pick up some of your points, rather frightens me, and I'll come back to why. Um, and also the criticality of enabling what is, as we described, a technology program. And that technology program can only be successful if we make uh, effective and free of um, barriers effective industrial collaboration. And I think for me, if I look at from an industrial point of view, they're the two big challenges facing AUKUS. So let's, let's look at um, the first of those in, ter in terms of time. Um, the submarine program, Pillar 1, is, is, is fundamental to shifting the balance of power in the Pacific and the ability for Australia and indeed um, US and Australia, um, UK and uh, America to project submarine deterrence into the Pacific is a fundamental shift in, in the power base in, in that area and allows us to project power into the Pacific, which is strategically important. But if we think about the timescales necessary to deliver that, and we think about the vision that Stephen's outlined of um, building and sustaining submarines in Australia, the challenges were 30 to 50 years away from that vision being a reality. So the idea of leveraging US Virginia-class submarines in the short to medium term, of the UK and Australia collaborating on the SSN AUKUS submarine, and accelerating that critically is going to be really, really important for that deterrent effect to, be, to, to take effect and, and bite in the politics of um, the, the Pacific region. If then look at Pillar 2, I couldn't agree more with what my uh, colleagues on the panel have said. Um, Pillar 2 is more difficult because it's multiple technologies and multiple stakeholders across multiple countries and many industrial players involved in all of them. And the result of that has, me has meant that Pillar 2 has really only just really got going in terms of making progress on those critical technologies. And finding ways for those 
critical times to be actually put into place and actual progress made is proving very difficult. So one of the priorities we've been talking to the UK MOD and indeed US DOD about particularly has been how we make to carve out small zones of focus and really drive those areas of technology forward very quickly as pathfinders for AUKUS over the next year, 18 months. But one of the big barriers to really progressing AUKUS has been defense industrial collaboration. Um, you mentioned the challenge of UK bureaucracy, um, having the pleasure of working in the US quite a bit. Um, yeah. Sadly, America can beat you on that one. Um, and the ability to change um, the export policies and ITAR constraints in place in terms of working with the US on defense industrial collaboration is absolutely fundamental to the success of AUKUS. Now, it's been really interesting to hear over the last um, six months or so some really positive noises coming from the US in terms of how that might change. But the very architecture of US industrial policy, ITAR policy, and export policy as such is designed to be painful and difficult to change. Um, that makes it highly resilient, but also highly inflexible. So one of the challenges for us as we think about how we uh, navigate that and make real progress on things like hypersonics, AI, ML, which are just fundamental to the sort of conflict we fear we might be facing, um, is to make rapid changes in that, in that collaborative environment to allow us to work collaboratively with between the UK, Australia, and the US in a very practical way on research and development, on product development, um, in the short to medium term to deliver the, the potential that AUKUS presents. Thank you very much, Lee. And now we'll turn to the view from across the pond, uh, the third pillar of the trilateral partnership. Ted, we'd love your view from DC. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm really glad that Nick mentioned ITAL. I was almost sort of putting a stopwatch on this to see how far we'd get into this whole panel before someone mentioned the dreaded word ITAR. Um, AUKUS is, yes, geostrategic, geostrategy, geopolitics, but from a practical point of view, it is about things for the Defense Department, but it is fundamentally going to be significantly run and permitted through the U.S. State Department. And from the U.S. point of view, particularly on the point of view of collaboration, that's really where the rubber is going to hit the road here. Uh, I don't really feel that we, we probably need to explain all of ITAR to this audience, but let me just sum it up really quickly. The essence of ITAR, International Trafficking and Arms Regulation, the U.S. system of defense export controls, is premised on the idea that the U.S. is the key and in many cases the only supplier of whatever this defense article is. And therefore, that if we don't let it out of the United States, no one else in the world is going to get it. Well, in 1955, 1965, 1975, maybe even 1985, that was maybe a fair working assumption. It is not a correct working assumption now, but the system's fundamental foundation is still there. And you know what? That's the preserve of the State Department. The U.S. has the most intellectually and practically sophisticated systems of defense export controls in the world by an enormous factor. You may not always like the results of that system. You know, sometimes people have, have disagreements with sort of the policy outputs of that system. But as a system itself, it is unparalleled in its sophistication and complexity. Uh, there are a lot of good things about that. I'm in favor of responsibility in U.S. defense exports. But it does create this enormous mechanism in the State Department, particularly the DDTC, the Directorate of Defense Trade Controls, which is premised on the idea that the first job of the State Department should be to say no to arms exports, to be suspicious about them. AUKUS is premised on the idea that there are a small number of, and I agree with the idea of expanding AUKUS in certain ways, but there is a small number of states around the world that are going to be highly trusted partners that we would hope don't need to be constrained within this ITAR suspicion first kind of system. That is not what the U.S. is set up to do. So the fundamental problem with delivering AUKUS from the U.S. perspective is that you are asking the United States to sort of push back against decades of inbuilt suspicion and prejudice against the free export of defense articles. I'm not saying it can't be done, but it is going to be extremely difficult because you're talking bureaucratic politics of the most fundamental sort here. 
when I hear that the UK is moving the AUKUS project to the MOD, I just scream in terror. This is absolutely the wrong approach to take because the State Department doesn't listen to defense people. It listens to diplomats. Um, Alicia, your committee needs to be driving this like crazy. The FCDO needs to be engaged on this all the time. They don't need to talk to DOD much, some, a little bit, but not too much. You can leave that to the MOD. You need to be going to the State Department. You need to be going to DDTC and making it really crystal clear that this is not going to work unless they get out of the road. And only diplomats, I'm afraid, are really going to be able to achieve that. So that's problem one. Problem two is that even if you get past that, and that is a huge assumption right there, but even if you get past that, there is still a lot of suspicion in the United States, particularly on the Democratic side, about making it easier to export arms or defense-related articles. The big Democratic push on the Hill now is for something called the Safeguard Act, which would essentially require all U.S. arms exports to go to Congress for individual votes. <sighs> yeah, I mean, if this, if this happens, you know, forget about it, right? I mean, we're not going to be exporting a pop gun at this point. So I don't, I don't want to be too alarmist about it. I don't think the Safeguard Act is going to pass. I, I, think, I think it's just it's so unsensible an idea, I really doubt they would ever make it through. But it does indicate the direction of travel of some folks in the Democratic Party who want to make it harder to collaborate and export on defense matters rather than easier with a very selective range of partners. Uh, the final thing I'll, I'll bring up is, yeah, there has been some, some good momentum, uh, I think, you know, in both the House and the Senate, some constructive measure has been taken, but always read the fine print on, well, any legislation, but U.S. legislation in particular. A lot of the administration's proposals to implement AUKUS, AUKUS have been premised on the idea that, yeah, we should have sort of a commonality of defense exports, et cetera, that sounds great, provided the UK and Australia adopt the US system of defense export controls. That's the traditional State Department poison pill. They've been using it for over 20 years, and they haven't given up on it yet. Uh, we managed to get Canada to change its system to essentially mirror the United States in a moment of Canadian weakness. And the, the American sort of State Department mentality sort of clings to this. We got the Canadians to do it. Next, we'll make the British do it. We'll make the Australians do it. You know, it's not going to happen. Uh, and it's the wrong goal. We should be aiming for comparability of outcomes on defense export controls, not precisely copying American mechanisms, which certainly have their own faults. So whenever you read about great progress on the Hill, always check to see if there's this poison pill, your systems have to be the same as ours. And if it says that, it's not really progress. Tell them to go back, um, you know, get your committee, get the FCDO on it, and please get us to change our minds. Thank you very much, Ted. Uh, a rallying <laughs> cry there. Alexander. Um, well, others have talked a lot about the geopolitics of all of this, but it's important to understand the context. and. Um, at the very heart of this relationship is what's sometimes called the five eyes, five eyes relationship between the five, well, predominantly English-speaking countries, the United States, UK, Canada, New Zealand and Australia. I want to emphasise this because um, the five eyes relationship, which is much more to do with exchanges of intelligence between each other, is built very much on a foundation of trust. I can tell you from nearly 12 years as the Foreign Minister of Australia, um, the countries that we would trust the most, we wouldn't have said this publicly at the time, um, but the countries that we would have trusted the most um, included the UK, but were the Five Eyes countries. Um, uh, Phil Goff is here, the New Zealand High Commissioner. During that period, he was the New Zealand Foreign Minister. And we did a huge amount of work together, particularly in the Pacific. Um, I mean, I don't like to say this too enthusiastically about Phil, because he's Labour. Um, 
but I did trust him. Um, and the thing is, uh, this relationship of trust can never, ever be underestimated. Then you had the you had um, uh, the referendum, of course, in 2016. Uh, what Policy Exchange did was establish an Indo-Pacific Commission chaired by the former Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper, and including and I was part of it, but including um, uh, people from Japan, Singapore, and so on, through, uh, from the uh, United States, substantially from around the world. Um, and it recommended that the UK government, having left the European Union, invest a lot more energy into the Indo-Pacific relationship. Why? Because the Indo-Pacific, um, number one, is where the bulk of global economic growth is going to be over the next few decades. Um, and secondly, as others have alluded to, it is the most significant and the most sensitive geopolitical part of the world because the world's most significant geopolitical issue is the rise of China and how to manage the rise of China. The other panellists have talk, talked about deterrence. I often talk about, yes, deterrence for sure, but about the importance in the Indo-Pacific if it, its economy is going to continue to prosper and we're all going to benefit from that. Um, that there is an appropriate power balance in the region. Um, and uh, how do we achieve that? Um, we achieve that, first of all, through our collaboration, and that has meant bringing in a country like the UK into the architecture of the Indo-Pacific with all that the UK has to offer, um, and it means investing very heavily in appropriate technology. Um, because one of you referred to the think tank that, um, and Alicia, I think, uh, yes, referred right. to the think tank um, that, um, I mean, it was Lo the Lowy Institute, I think, that um, concluded that um, China had a huge lead, a, a technological lead over us in the West in many areas. Um, you know, this may be right or this may be wrong, but the important thing to understand is that we need to invest very heavily in technology in order to maintain that power balance, if not to uh, make sure we retain an advantage over a rising China. Um, so AUKUS has come out of a lot of this thinking, um, and um, I say that Pillar 2 is, um, you know, that is collaboration between the three AUKUS countries on artificial intelligence, on cyber, on all of those sorts of things, new technologies. Um, it is a wonderful thing. And for our three countries to collaborate, to work together, have joint projects, it's going to maximise the opportunities we have of ensuring that the technological gap doesn't open up with China, because if it does, their implications will be very severe. Um, Pillar one, the, the submarine project, I say, I say time is of the essence here. Um, can I be um, brutal here at this meeting? There is a lot of cynicism in Australia about the timing of the uh, submarine relationship. Yes, Australia is going in the short term, to buy two or is it Stephen three um, Virginia class submarines from the Americans, um, so that will fill a gap. Um, while we wait for the um, UK, the US, and ourselves to build the new generation of SSN, um, but you know um, how defence contracts operate. Um, this could take a very, very long time. And there's a plan in Australia, which Stephen alluded to, to build um, the Australian submarines in my hometown of Adelaide um, at a huge expense, at a huge expense. Um, so um, uh, I say um, this is important, uh, but it is a long-term project and it is very important that the defence contractors understand and the governments understand the importance of time. Because at the rate this would go, if history is any guide, by the time these submarines are completed, um, where will China be? So we have to think about this, think about this very carefully, about the timing of it. Um, but um, in conclusion, let me just say I think it's, um, it's fantastic to see this government here in this country 
doing so much in the Indo-Pacific region to maximise Britain's advantages in that part of the world, getting involved in the security architecture, the CPTPP, the free trade agreement amongst countries in that area, which the UK is now joining, UK's increased in engagement with ASEAN and so on. It is, it is great to see, and I think the UK, you know, this is global Britain, the UK is going to become much more relevant, important in its values, make a much bigger statement on the global stage than would have been the case in times gone by. Thank you very much, Alexander. Now, I'm mindful we don't have an enormous amount of time, and I want to get to as many questions as possible. So what I'm going to do is just uh, fire some, some very quick questions um, at the panel. Um, I might start with um, you, Alicia. You mentioned industrial strategy. Now, as we are here at Conservative Party Conference, it seems to me that the Conservative Party has not always been extremely comfortable with the idea of industrial policy. And industrial policy is kind of where the direction of travel is going, all of our allies, whether that's what's going on, the Biden administration in the US, um, the EU, you know, are drafting up these extraordinary new programs that, you know, it's, there's subsidies, but there's also sort of kind of long-term co-creation, co-development projects, all sorts of other different instruments of the state, yeah. choosing these sectors, these capabilities that are going to be really vital and kind of going all in on them. And um, that still seems to be something that we have a much harder time institutionally getting our head around and showing enthusiasm for here. And some might even say that the government is, is sort of distinctly disinterested in this and that that could be putting us at a disadvantage compared to our peers. Because industrial policy seems so central in AUKUS, you know, how, how would you make the conservative case yeah. for industrial policy? So look, you know, let's break down what industrial um, policy is. It's productivity, it's growth, it's jobs, it's earning power. Are these not inherent conservative values that we believe in? It's about security. It's about security of jobs, security of country, security of supply chains, you name it. Um, we have a natural ability to have an industrial strategy, whether it's the universities, whether it's the private capital within our city, um, whether it's the good industrial base that we already have. And the reality is, look at who we are up against. The Chinese government has every single lever of influence, every single strata of their society, not just their state, working on whatever industrial strategy or priority they decide to pick to direct them at. This isn't about picking winners or choosing losers, as some want to say it is. It's about giving confidence to industry to work long term. It's about making long term decisions, investing in skills and things like critical minerals. It, it, it just all makes sense. And the reality is, if you really want to play devil's advocate, without an industrial strategy, what we are essentially saying as a country is that we're willing to essentially hang on the coattails of the US's industrial strategy. That's not good enough, in my opinion. We need our own industrial strategy. There is no reason why we cannot do it. We have all the building blocks. And frankly, with the threat we face in the modern day, we have no excuse to be letting down our people by not investing in core industries that will protect us now and in the long term and also give business the confidence they need to keep doing it. Fabulous. Thank you, Alicia. Um, Stephen, I, I know this is a big question to answer briefly, but um, Australia has obviously put enormous resources behind AUKUS. It's 360 billion thereabouts. Um, it's really regarded as a kind of nation building project. And so there is that kind of central oversight across all the different pieces of the puzzle that need to come together to make this work. In your view, if you had just sort of one thing that you want in your time as High Commissioner here, the UK government to understand about this project, to help raise the British ambition on AUKUS, what would that be? Well, I don't have any uh, qualms, concerns or worries about the UK ambition for AUKUS, either Pillar 1 or Pillar 2. That's the first point. So I have conversations with British interlocutors uh, every day of the week and, and uh, I see uh, reflected in them the same ambition that we have. So I, I don't share some of the, sort of the reservations around the table. For example, um, whilst it appears as though AUKUS Pillar 2 uh, from external eyes looks like it's an MOD 
project. The reality is, on the conversations I've had, of course the Permanent Undersecretary has been given responsibility for defence, has been given responsibility for that, Dave Williams, but he, he is seeing that as a whole of government project. He reports to and consults with the NSA, with the Cab Cabinet Secretary and the like. So um, I, I think, Pillar 2, it's really important that there is a whole of government approach. So I don't have any of those qualms. I, I think we understand we have a huge ambition here for both nations. In, whilst the United States is our traditional security alliance partner, you can mount a pretty good case now that so far as the building of submarines is concerned, that Australia and the UK is now the more important of the relationship so far as submarines is concerned vis-a-vis -vis Australia and the US and the UK and the US. So I don't see any lack of understanding of the ambition, the need to do it. These are huge implementation tasks and they require assiduous attention on a daily basis for a 30 to 40 year uh, timetable. That's absolutely true. I think we now need to move on to the gripping up of, 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 of Pillar 2. Uh, and in terms of the length, the scale, the time, every time I'm worried about is this too long to form an effective projection of power or deterrence vis-a-vis -vis China, I just have a look at what China does on a daily basis in the IAEI to, to mount a fallacious argument this is somehow contrary to the yeah. Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. That tells you they've worked it out. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> point taken. Uh, Nick, is there, I mean, there's obviously enormous opportunities um, for UK industry with the creation of a trilateral marketplace. Um, and it strikes me just how quickly and decisively industry has taken the signal from government that AUKUS is going to be very important and has all kind of moved to, to create sort of trilateral arms of their business. But are there any potential risks for UK industry that in some ways we're actually opening ourselves up to competition without making ourselves more competitive? Um, I would argue no very strongly. I mean, the, the um, defence industry is already very global um, and highly competitive. Um, I think picking up your point, Alicia, the, the, there is undoubtedly a need for an industrial policy in the UK to reflect AUKUS. Um, and indeed, I think you know some of those who uh, pour scorn on the idea of industrial policy see it as a protectionist approach. I think that's ne not necessarily the case at all. Um, and one of the very big lessons of Ukraine is a failure to have an industrial policy is a massive failure in defence policy. Um, so I think AUKUS provides a fantastic opportunity for UK defence industry um, to work out how it can play on a bigger scale, how it can leverage its capability across the whole AUKUS alliance, um, and play a much larger role indeed in US defence market where um, the spend levels are much higher and where there is demand for innovative leading edge technology which we in the UK often bring. Thank you Nick and I'm going to go to the audience in a, in a moment so please get your questions ready. Ted, there has been a sort of uh, a degree of consternation amongst many of America's allies watching the political situation of recent years uh, play out in DC, and obviously some quite significant questions being asked about America's future defense interests and priorities. Obviously here in Europe, there, there is a very live question going on about what next year's elections might mean. How does AUKUS fit into this puzzle? Do you see this as quite significant in terms of grounding the US in a long-term alliance structure? Is that how we should see something like AUKUS? And how does that fit in with the kind of broader geostrategic competition that, that America is engaged in? Just two quick observations on that. I would say that the first president since 1945 who did not clearly view Europe as the most important part of the world was President Obama. Uh, he sort of began the shift, and it wasn't because particularly anything that he believed, it was a reflection of long-term economic and geopolitical trends. If it hadn't been President Obama, it would have been President X in his place. Inevitably, the attention of the U.S. with the rise of China and the rise of a lot of South Asian nations was going to shift more towards the Pacific. It just happened to occur, to begin to really occur under President Obama. Uh, and that trend has really continued. Ukraine has interrupted that trend for a moment, uh, and that is a very important interruption indeed, but it hasn't fundamentally changed the long-term calculations that, is, that have and will continue to lead the United States to look more at the Pacific. 
The second fundamental thing that's happened, and you can see it happening here too in the UK as well. I remember back to George Osborne's golden age comments of what, only about a decade or so ago. Uh, the US for a long time, both parties, really operated under the view that if we just traded more with the Chinese and were really super nice and supportive, uh, they would come around our way of thinking. You don't find anyone in the US who is willing to accept a particle of that you know, conclusion, I'll just put it that way, anymore. Does that mean that everyone is going to be equally committed to AUKUS and making a success of it? Not necessarily, because unfortunately I entirely agree with Nick that the U.S. system and its bureaucratic scale and complexity makes the U.K. system uh, look, you know, positively, you know, trim and, and slender and lean. Uh, but it does give sort of a basic level of, I think, reality to U.S. Strate uh, alliance diplomacy, defense diplomacy, strategy, and defense trade discussions. So I think you, I never want to predict what's going to happen out of U.S. politics. It's not my job. But I would say there is every incentive in the U.S. system for us to continue to talk about AUKUS in a serious way. I only hope that the level of commitment that we put in it, into it in reality is as real as our rhetoric is. Thanks, Ted. And just finally, Alexander, um, obviously you've been so involved in this question of the Indo-Pacific tilt. Um, you know, the, we've, we had the Indo-Pacific tilt moment, and then we've had the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and now we have a war still raging on Europe's shores. Um, you know, we're obviously also living in a time of deeply constrained resources. So while there seems to be an increasing recognition that these two security theaters are linked, and there are dependencies, there are hard choices that are having to be made about our high, hard power capabilities in, in, in each of them. Do you think that AUKUS sufficiently expresses the UK's hard power commitments in the Indo-Pacific, or would you like to see more? Uh, well, I'm not sure that sufficiently is the right way of putting it, but it does represent a very substantial investment um, by the UK in defence. Um, it's not as though the new generation of nuclear submarines that the UK would build would um, be devoted entirely to the Indo-Pacific region. So in that sense, um, the defence equipment implications of AUKUS and the technology that will evolve through Pillar 2 will be useful worldwide, including, um, in, at least in the case of the submarines, around Europe and in the Atlantic theatre. So it's important to look at it that way. The second thing I would say about Ukraine is, um, you kind of alluded to it in your question, don't underestimate the linkages between Ukraine and the Indo-Pacific, um, Russia and China, um, the uh, China-Taiwan factor. All of these things are linked. So um, if the United States and its allies were to sh show a flagging resolve in Ukraine, that would have huge, broader implications, including for the Indo-Pacific region. It would lead Beijing to come to the same conclusion that Putin has come to, which is the West lacks resilience and determination. Um, and that will put Taiwan in much more danger um, than it is a, a, um, at the moment. And I say at the moment, because the reaction, the very solid reaction of the West to the invasion of Ukraine um, has surprised Russia, has surprised China, um, and I think has led to Beijing thinking very carefully about whether the strategy they've been pursuing towards the West has made any sense. But if we start to weaken our resolve in Ukraine, uh, then um, they will, uh, in China, um, Russia and um, Iran, for that matter, think that the West is a bit of a paper tiger and that is the risk. I just want to say yeah. one other thing because I always want to say this. I think one of the worst mistakes that the United States has made was the way they withdrew from Afghanistan. And that sent a terrible message to Russia and to China. 
and I actually, some of you will really shoot me down for this, but I don't care. Um, I think that Putin would not have invaded Ukraine if it hadn't been for that sudden withdrawal from Afghanistan. I really do, because I think that sent a terrible message about the lack of resolve that the West has. So resolve in Ukraine is critical to the Indo-Pacific, and the UK must always be there. Anyway, with this government, with the Tory government, they have been. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's go to the audience for some questions. We do have a mic. Um, we might take a couple together. Um, and if you can just say your name and, and any affiliation you have. Um, so we've got gentlemen down here first. Thank you. No, uh, Aaron Rankin for the Northern Ireland Conservatives and also uh, Anglo-Aussie, hence the interest. Oh. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, there's been talk of actually possibly expanding AUKUS to other sort of friendly countries that we're building alliances with, such as uh, Japan. Uh, is, is, is there any like prospect for that or would there be implications with that for, say, Japan not being in the Five Eyes and also the uh, US arms uh, export limitations? Brilliant. And we'll just take another one and then come back together. Um, gentlemen in the green. Uh, Niall Phillips from Barrow and Furnace and a BE Systems employee. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> understand the, um, the opportunity, but the capacity, capability and resilience requirements for building these submarines rel relies on long-term commitments. Um, and moving under the Department of Defence or Ministry of Defence in the, in the various sectors, where does that leave stability from a political leadership perspective? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Two great questions. Um, okay, so first is around expanding AUKUS to other partners and, and then uh, maintaining both institutional and I think perhaps maybe we could also address the question of political uh, resilience around the project, uh, given we are looking at such extraordinary timeframes along here. Um, Hi, Commissioner. Sure. Well, firstly, in terms of AUKUS Plus, as I've seen it so described, I think it's really important in the first instance that we grip up pillar two of AUKUS first, so we've got the strand of future slash advanced leaning technologies, and we've gripped them up as three nations before we start thinking about, well, who can we add in? And I think it is within contemplation that once we've gripped that up, we can look to like-minded countries, particularly Japan. I've, out of the mouths of the Japanese ambassador, I've heard the phrase, AUKUS needs to become Jorkus. Um, and, and I think, I think that, potential or, that, that potential or prospect is there within the context of particular, particular proposals. Uh, and I think we need, just uh, Alexander made the strong point about Five Eyes, we need to be careful to not to make sure that whatever we're doing in Five Eyes, we don't arbitrarily or artificially seek to designate as, as Three Eyes or AUKUS. So I think once we've gripped up Pillar 2, we can then look at, well, what particular techno technological capability might a Japan or a Korea bring to a particular project? So I think that's within contemplation. In terms of the long-term commitment, in Australia, as Alexander knows, for a long time we've spoken about, look, the Australia-US alliance goes on forever. It doesn't really matter who's in power, Republicans or Democrats, Labor or Liberal. And I frankly think we need to start talking in the same terms about the Australia-UK relationship. You know, the reality is we've got a Labor government in Australia at the moment, we've got a, we've got a Conservative government here. The, the uh, resolution which the Deputy Prime Minister and uh, Prime Minister of Australia put through the recent Labor uh, national conference would have been respectable in this environment and, and, and the, the dealing and the work I do with, with secretaries of state and officials every day of the week just continues to have me essentially saying uh, this, this, is, this is an operation that could equally be a political or a government operation in Australia. So I, I've, I'm in no doubt about the long-term political commitment in both countries and I think that as governments change there'll be a seamless commitment to, to these long-term uh, strategic and security um, arrangement. So, um, I think AUKUS Plus, project by project, yeah, is a prospect down the track and long term political commitment. Uh, I think one of the lessons if you go to Barrow is that if you start a huge national endeavour of this nature, once you start, you can't stop. Because if you stop, you lose the program entirely. That's one of the two big lessons from Barrow. Yeah. So, we've started and we cannot stop. Alicia. I mean, you took the words out of my mouth. The big problem with Barrow is we didn't continue to invest in skills. And now, as a result, we're running around the country going, where are the skills to maintain what we've got as a <laughs> core part of our deterrence? 
Um, so Barrow is the best example for us to learn from. I think it is absolutely key that AUKUS becomes apolitical, which is exactly what Five Eyes is, which is exactly what the UK-US special relationship is. Um, I do have worries, though, about it. And the reality is that we're all in this room because we're conservatives. And yet only a few days ago, we had the shadow foreign secretary tweeting saying that he supports the nuclear deterrent. Um, and then reminder that he voted in 2016 against protecting the nuclear deterrent. Um, we do have to make sure that we do not see short-sighted decision-making coming from those trying to appease the far-left socialist wing of the Labour Party, who we should be in no doubt at the next election, no matter what the outcome, there will be more of those who are on the far left within the Labour Party coming to Parliament. Um, and that is a real concern. In terms of Japan being integrated... I am not one of those people who thinks that Japan should join the Five Eyes, and I do see those conversations taking place and people raising them. I would not expand Five Eyes in any way, sense or form. Um, it works perfectly because of exactly how it is. Um, there is a real reality as to why the Five Eyes works, and it does come to trust. And everything Alexander said, it comes from joint working, joint values, the way in which we approach things. But, as I've said, I put into my report for my committee, Japan and South Korea should be part of Strand B. We need them. This isn't us being kind and saying, oh, we'll be lovely and let Japan and South Korea in. They bring a meaningful technological advancement and they would help us move faster down this journey and we need every help we can get to move faster on it. And I mean, even if they're not formally integrated yeah. into the alliance, um, there will be extraordinary benefits for all members of our closer, you know, G7 plus 10, yeah. uh, sorry, plus three grouping, because obviously the sort of work that we're going to go on with the US uh, would have potentially benefits that could, could be expanded out elsewhere. Um, I just want to take, uh, see if we can get another couple of questions in. So I'll just, and I'll come to our other panelists then to come in on those. So, um, uh, yep, okay. So gentlemen over here, if we can race over, sorry. Okay. Got your yeah. skates on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, Willie Sterling from Scotland, Sterling and Clap Manager. Um, what would an industrial strategy look like? We talk about this, but in a granular term and in terms of how it would actually work just between departments of the, of the civil service, let alone how it would work with sort of JVs abroad or, uh, you know, there is a reason we stopped having industrial strategies. They were defence orientated in the first place in World War II and then carried on for a very, very, very long time until they fell to pieces in the 70s. The idea was that capital is a much more efficient way left to do it on its own. So are we talking a broad industrial strategy? How is it going to, what is the task force going to be? Is it going to be people Sorry, from I'm every department? Sorry, I'm just going to cut you off because we're going to run out of time. Um, and one other final question then. Uh, over here. Sorry, <laughs> furthest away. Edward Hull from the University of Oxford. Is AUKUS an example of assuring allies or deterring China and North Korea and other adversaries? Oh, good. Okay, industrial strategy and uh, is AUKUS more about assuring allies or uh, deterring China? Um, Alexander. Um, yes, I skip on the industrial strategy. I'm a bit with you in your question there, by the way. I mean, you can have a, a defence industrial strategy. I can understand that. But um, uh, I will very quickly say um, politicians uh, investing in, in projects, um, I've seen an awful lot of them terribly unsuccessful. Um, it's, it's not about assuring allies. It's about working with allies to ensure that we maintain a balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region above all. And um, in order to do that, we have to be um, ahead of the game on technology. And um, three countries which already have high levels of sophistication when it comes to technology, collaborating together is in those um, front-end um, defence technologies, um, it's going to make a huge difference. I think it's just, it's just common sense and therefore it's going to enhance our capacity to deter and enhance our capacity to maintain that balance of power. And the, the same for the submarines, really. So I don't think it's just about assuring uh, um, uh, allies. It's, it, it's about uh, the balance of power and deterrence. Thank you. Uh, Nick, any quick thoughts on what the industrial strategy question in particular? No, yeah. 
I, I personally think a defense industrial strategy is a necessity. Mm -hmm. it, it, the the defense market, in, in, for good or bad, is not an open capitalist market. It's a market that responds to individual government procurements, and the government specifies them. So it is a abnormal market in that sense. If we look at you know, earlier, question was around uh, Barrow and Finesse and, and the need for industrial strategy to support that. The reason why the astute class submarine program went so badly wrong and cost us billions extra was that post Trafalgar class submarine fleet, we failed to continue to invest in Barrow and Finesse and maintain capability. It's a perfect example alongside munitions, um, supply chain, and need for accelerated development of next gen capabilities at the moment, which is why we need industrial strategy in the UK. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Ted. Uh, very quickly, I, I think there is an element of reassurance, but I don't think it's about reassuring, um, I think it's about reassuring allies that the U.S. is remaining committed uh, to, you know, an alliance role worldwide and particularly uh, in the Pacific. I'm not myself particularly concerned about this, but I mean, I, I do think that there is a reassurance element about it. So I don't think, you know, 80% deterrence, 20% reassurance, perhaps. I don't know what the right proportion is. Uh, on the industrial strategy and the long-term question, look, the pattern of UK defense spending and defense planning over the last 30 or so years has been a declining share of GDP devoted to defense relentless reprofiling of, of procurement programs, uh, spurious demands for greater efficiency from the, the MOD and promises that you know, magically the amount of money that the UK wants to spend on defense can be reconciled with, with its defense needs by bringing greater efficiencies from the MOD. When that doesn't happen, programs are reprofiled, expenses rise, and the National Audit Office comes out with another report saying that Britain can't procure efficiently on defense, thereby blaming the system for precisely the demands and the delays and the increased expense caused by the reprofiling in the first place. If the UK gets into that cycle on AUKUS, it's an absolute death knell. So I don't know what the answer is on this, but I would be extremely suspicious of anyone who says that the solution to this problem rests in increased MOD efficiencies, which in theory I'm all in favor of, but the reality is they are, that call is advanced for political purposes, and anyone who says that this can be done on the current level of defense spending, because the history of the last 30 years in this country and in the United States shows convincingly that it cannot. Final word, High Commissioner. Uh, in terms of is it assuring allies or deterring China, I think it's a it's a combination of integrated defence and deterrence strategy plus a regional balancing strategy. So this is this is this is a strategic circumstance where we c this can't be left to the United States alone. So every like-minded country who can contribute to a regional balancing strategy in, in the Indo-Pacific or integrated defence and deterrence needs to be putting their shoulder to the wheel. That includes the UK, Australia, EU. Japan, Korea, India, Indonesia, Singapore, and so all elements of, 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 of state power needs to be brought to this purpose. Secondly, in terms of in industrial strategy, defence procurement capability has always been, as has been said, uh, in some nature or form, an industrial strategy. I think when we're talking about industrial strategy, we need to understand that we've gone through a period for 30 or 40 years where global international economic policy applied. We thought we were living in a peace dividend. We thought that uh, we could just focus on prosperity. We looked at global international competition. Uh, there was no picking winners. It was, it was let the market determine. The market is now constrained and policy is now constrained by dramatically changed strategic circumstance. Where we need to be thinking about well, where does a policy prescription now apply is in a whole range of those area, areas where China has an effective monopoly. This particularly applies in critical minerals, uh, in lithium batteries and electric uh, vehicle metals. And that's where leaving it to the market has failed because 96% of uptake agreements for critical minerals and lithium batteries go to China, which means there is a monopoly in the market and a monopoly at the starting point of that industry. And so we need to find the policy prescription, whether you call it an industrial strategy, whether you call it a necessary security response, we need to find a way in which we break China's stranglehold on those really important economic and security and strategic elements and, uh, and resources. That's, that's the area where, where an inverted commas, a, an industrial strategy, a security strategy, 
uh, a access to finance strategy is an imperative for all of us. Thank you, Stephen. I've personally found using the phrase enabling environment seems to <laughs> <laughs> help get you into those conversations for, without uh, causing so many shivers down spines. Um, thank you so much. We're, we're going to have to close then. Um, I'd love, like to thank very much my panelists and also um, Northrop for making it possible for us to host this event today. I really am shocked that there, aren't, that there isn't an enormous uh, marketplace of debate at these party conferences around AUKUS. It's the most exciting, enormous <laughs> project that we're, uh, that, that we're doing and, um, you know, something that's going to be so integral to so many different uh, parts of our life as well as our um, defense capabilities. So um, I really hope that when we uh, convene again next year, we're going to be competing against a host of other different <laughs> events. Um, we are doing an enormous amount on AUKUS at PX, we have some really exciting things in the pipeline. We'll be launching an industry forum soon, um, but lots of public events and, and so on. So we'd love to get everyone involved in that. So um, please do follow us and um, let's keep the conversation going. But uh, for now, I will close. Please join me in thanking our panelists.